for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. to listen to the sick podcast with tony marinara 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time boston four montreal three 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est bon. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. Stanley pour les Canadiens. Le 23e de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together, they worked the young team to the top. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground. Your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. It's the Sick Podcast. I'm Marinero. I'm in on this Friday, April 19, even though I'm usually not in on Fridays, but today is a special occasion because it's the day of the Barry F. Lorenzetti Foundation with uh, the Foundation Cup that took place earlier this morning at the Bell Center. As a matter of fact, a lot of former NHLers, a lot of members of the artistic world, celebrities, a lot of people were there. It was a lot of fun raising money towards mental health and towards autism. I can tell you, $150,000 were raised for these two fantastic and very worthy causes. The Sick Podcast is brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different, and also brewed in Quebec and a winner of a dozen international awards. It's brought to you by Labitta TB, offering quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. Labitta TB, embrace your true nature. I am live at Da Vinci Restaurant. When I say live, it's actually afternoon right now it's about 1 30 in the afternoon where this is being taped to be played live later tonight at 10 p.m of course thank you all for watching on youtube thank you all for watching on facebook and thank you all for watching on twitter among those who are participating earlier today at the bell center and playing a game of hockey let me tell you he could still skate and someone said to me I think Paul Byron could still play in the National Hockey League. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Sick Podcast, former Montreal Canadian. Let's bring him in. Paul, take a seat. Paul Byron, how are you? Doing well, thanks, Tony. How are you? Very, very good, Paul. Uh, first off, congratulations on your career. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. Uh, throughout your entire career, so much admiration for not only anyone who makes it to play pro sports, but a small guy like yourself. I know you heard this. I'm sure there weren't too many people that bet on you. Uh, I'm sure you heard all your life that you were too small and weren't going to make it. And for me, the one thing I've noticed in all the sports is when smaller athletes end up making it, they have a force of mental toughness and a force of character that probably others don't have because they have to fight that much more. Yeah, I think so. Um, growing up as a kid, if you would have told me, hey, you're going to play 500 games in the NHL, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, even at 16, 17, uh, that, that dream just seems so far away, but... Kind of just took it one year at a time. Um, I love hockey. I love the game. I love pushing myself. And, you know, my competitive nature just kind of grew and developed. And uh, I was really lucky to have the right people at the right time believe in me. And getting to Gatineau with Ben grew. Uh, you know, he grew me to be an NHLer. Today, 2024, easier or harder for a player of your size to make it to the National Hockey League? Much easier. Much easier. Just the way the game's played, the spacing, um, not having the hooking, the holding. Um, you know, you look at teams now, I think the league's actually gone smaller than it was maybe 20 years ago, but um, you see it in the game now. It's so fast, it's so skilled. Everyone can skate, everyone can shoot. There's fourth-line players that are just really good hockey players nowadays, so it's great to see the the quality of hockey is amazing. I can't wait to talk to you about the work that you do with the Montreal Canadiens and player development. I know you're having fun with that, but before I do, today's a special cause, of course, the Barry F. Lorenzetti Foundation. Uh, talk to us about how many of these fundraisers that you take part in and how much fun it is for you to still get back on the ice and, and see some of the guys. Yeah, it's my first one in hockey. Uh, getting back on the ice, a lot of fun. Um, it's a great sport. I love still putting on the skates. Uh, not quite skating like I used to. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but um, I, I love doing it. Uh, I've done a lot of golf events, charity stuff in the past, and uh, to be able to give your time for such a great cause, help people out, you know, it's a, it's a pretty rewarding feeling, kind of using your platform, your your, your status to, to help, you know, raise money is a, is a great, great cause. And 
um, it's really good to see the the face uh, people make when they see you. You get to make a pass to them on, on the ice. It's, uh, it's a pretty rewarding feeling. You were drafted by the Buffalo Sabres, went on to Calgary, picked up by the Montreal Canadiens on waivers. You had a chance to be with several organizations. Montreal is home for you. Yep. Talk to me about how good Montreal was for your career and still is for you today. Uh, I mean, to think even nowadays, to put on that that, that sweater, you know, uh, the first time still gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Um, it was incredible for me and my family. My wife's French-Canadian. Uh, coming home from Alberta, it, it, it was a blessing. Um, I was on the verge of maybe signing Europe. I had, I had good offers to go and play in Geneva. I was very, very close to signing a deal in, in, in Russia to, to play in CSK in Moscow. And I just kind of stuck with it, believed in myself. But that, that day that the phone rang and, hey, you're going to Montreal. It was something special. And um, I always thought I'd go home to Ottawa and, and, and go back home, see my, see my family and friends. But as we've been here eight, nine years, it's, it's home now. We're rooted. My kids have friends, and uh, I still get to work with the team, and uh, it's really a dream come true. I couldn't ask for any more. Talk to us about your health. We know that your career ended probably sooner than you would have wanted to. There was an accumulation of injuries. What actually um, stopped you out of all the injuries you had? What were you feeling? What stopped you from doing, uh, continuing to do what you love? Yeah, um, I, I had my hip fixed uh, right after the playoff run. I got to a point where I, I, I mean, I could barely even walk after hockey games. So I got my hip fixed, and it made a big difference. And uh, that next year was pretty challenging. I felt like uh, I had to come back. I was a leader on the team. Morale was pretty low. I felt like maybe I, I rushed back a little too early, and I didn't build up the kind of strength and capacity I probably needed to, to be an NHLer. But I kind of just figured that I'd, I'd pick up on the go and, 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 and just get better. And, you know, I'll just keep playing forever like I've always done. And uh, I, I tore the three muscles off the pubic bone on, on the right side. And since that point, uh, I never really got better. Um, I went and saw I have doctors, specialists, the imaging everywhere, MRIs, CT scans, like you name it, I've done it. And uh, even to this day, it's never felt like it's healed properly. And you know, I'll go out there today and just kind of cruise around. I might be sore for a couple of days after that. And the wear and tear it takes to play in the NHL, the grind, the workout, the training, the intensity. Unfortunately, I just wasn't able to do it anymore. And that's where you have to respect what people do at this level to play. Um, it takes an enormous amount of energy, time. And if you don't have your health, uh, you know, you can't be an effective player anymore. You know, obviously, it's it's a good life because that's what you wanted to do and you did it. But you also talked about how hard a life it is and how disciplined a lifestyle you have to have. Um, can you put it into context? Because a lot of people think that it's it's all fun and games and it's all roses being a professional <laughs> athlete. Yeah. That, uh, you know, they practice a couple of hours a day or they get to play when they're not practicing and they got a lot of free time and they got long summers. And talk to me about the day-to-day -day and the fact that it's basically 12 months a year. Yeah. Um, everything you do makes a difference on the ice. So it starts in your morning, right? You get a good sleep, how you feel, you know, your, your, how you wake up, if, if you have energy, are you tired, are you fatigued, um, what you eat, what you put into your body, your nutrition, your workout, your gym, um, building that intensity, that workload, having specific goals, targets to get stronger, faster. Um, you know, as I grew in, in my career, as I, as I started to really focus on, on, on power lifting and explosion, like I got faster, quicker. So building that kind of program, then then you go home. Well, what do you do with your free time? Do you just go home, sit on the computer? No, like you got to stay active. You got to keep your mind sharp. You you got to watch video, watch film, watch your clips, and then and then on game days, you you, you know you're at the rink in the morning. You go home, you take a quick nap, and you're back at the rink at three thirty. You you just live at the rink. It's 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 everything. It's your lifestyle. The season ends. You might take a couple weeks off, but then you restart again. You know, your friends are, are going to bars, this and that, but you got a job to do. You got to train. You got to work out. You're an athlete. You got to, are you, are you on the bubble? Are you trying to get in the NHL? Are you an American league guy? Are you established? And, and, and you're trying to get higher in the lineup. Are you just trying to keep your job? You know, it's, it, it never ends. You live kind of day to day as a hockey player and, and, and you can't really focus too far into the future. You just kind of focus on tomorrow and, um, it's definitely been a, a challenge for me uh, last year and this year is just kind of getting out of that and, and being a normal person again. But it's something I miss. Uh, you know, once you once you start it, it's uh, it's everything. It's it's your life. It's not just a game. We saw you the other night in the Loge on uh, the final home game of the season, of course, versus the Red Wings with Carey Price sitting next yep. to you. We haven't heard much from Carey. Obviously, he hasn't been too much in the media. I, I know you have a real good relationship, always did, and probably always will. Um, 
for the benefit of the listeners, those watching, those listening, how's he doing? He's doing really well. He looks really healthy, really happy. Um, you know, he, he wants to make a presence in Montreal. He loves coming to the games. He loved being there the other night. But, uh, you know, mentally he's in a really good headspace. He looks very healthy. And, it, you know, being in Montreal is just hard as, you know, being him. You know, you go to the grocery store, you go to the golf course. It's like every single place he goes, everyone knows who he is. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a big weight he wears on his shoulders. So the fact that he can go home, go to Kelowna, and just kind of live a normal life and, and unwind a bit is uh, – don't speak for him. I'll keep you for one or two more. We have a long list of people that we want to talk to. But for me, I'm having a lot of fun talking to you. I actually wish this could go on forever. But, you know, you talked about your injuries. and You would have liked to have played longer. And we talked about the fact you're not a big guy. And I think of Nick Suzuki's 5'11". Yep. Best season of his career under Marty St. Louis. Cole Caulfield's probably 5'8". Best season of his career under Marty St. Louis. Alex Newhook, 5'11". Best season of his career under Marty St. Louis. It's too bad Paul Byron never played under Marty <laughs> St. Louis because I just have a feeling, as useful as you were as a player, I think I think you could have thrived under him. You I get that feeling? Or? I think so, too. Um, I, I love Marty. I love his thinking, his mind, uh, what he brings to the team. Um, you know, I was fortunate I had some great coaches in my career, but not able to play with Marty and, and the admiration I had for him as a player and what he did and, and what I see he does day to day. Uh, I'm a little bit jealous. I'm not going to lie. I see all these guys and I'm super happy for them. Um, you know, we see what's in the pipeline. We saw Lane the other night. We saw Logan, how dynamic those players are, what they can do to, to shape a team. And uh, I'm very fortunate to be in the organization still because I think our future is very bright and you know the troops are coming. I don't think it's going to be too long. Awesome. Player development. Who have you had a chance to work with in the past year? I've worked with uh, Owen Beck, uh, Philip Massar. I uh, did a little bit of work with Cedric Guidon, uh, Mil Heineman. His, his year was a little bit uh, rocky at the start. He went through some head stuff. Uh, you know, that's that's always hard. It's challenging. He's got a good shot. He's got a great shot. Big guy. Uh, different than, than what we have on, on the team currently right now. I think uh, there's definitely a, you know, a spot for that kind of player on any team. And uh, other than that, I do a lot of uh, on-ice development, a lot of rehab skates. So the team will go on the road, and guys that have injuries are coming back. They'll, they'll kind of call me in and, and, and do the skating there. So pretty involved kind of all over the place. I don't do as much travel as Frankie and Rob to go visit guys, but uh, I'm pretty pretty busy with my son, his hockey, his team. And, you know, communication now is so easy with, 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 with FaceTime and, and text. You know, I uh, keep, a, keep a good tap on my players, and uh, I'm very excited to, to get some guys in Laval and actually get to work one-on-one -on -one with them in person. Is it safe to say that some of these players that you talked about, you work a lot on skating with them or, or on other? It's, it, it, it depends. Um, I don't really do much skating work with them. Um, skating is kind of unique. You, you can't really build a base of skating over one or two practices. It's something that it's probably more of a summertime project, I'd say, and you know, we'll see how the summer goes with me, Adam, and Scott, how we want to divvy up our time and who does what. But sometimes it's just kind of understanding what to do on the ice, where to go, how to support. Um, you know, as a fast player, the hardest thing for me sometimes was skating out of position a lot. And and I'd always want to skate, skate, skate. But sometimes you have to slow down. And then when you get the puck, that's when you move fast. And sometimes guys are in a rush to, to speed up. But... They need to stay in support lanes and support their defense better or support their center better. And, and then once you get the puck, now is when you use their speed. And so I did a lot of work with that with the guys. Two more questions. One on Owen Beck, a second round pick by the Montreal Canadiens a couple of years ago. If I'm not mistaken, I think 33rd in the draft uh, was the best faceoff guy in the OHL the year of his draft year. What can you tell us about his game and how far away you think he is? It's hard to say how far away he is. I really like his game. He plays a pro-style game. Like you said, he's, he's, he's a very, very strong guy. He's great on face-offs. Um, he skates really well. He's hard. He's physical. I have lots of clips of him like kind of going to corners and crushing guys. So there's no doubt in my mind he's going to be a great pro player. Ultimately, it's kind of up to him uh, how he does next year in Laval and, and, and what opportunity arises for him in, in, in Montreal. And, and um, you know, I'm super excited. I think uh, what we have with Kirby, what we have with Nick, he brings something different, which is what you need on the team. And, uh, and the future is very bright for him. Great last, man. Last question, and we're going to get to uh, former Quebec Nordique coach Michel Bergeron of TVA Sport in just one minute, but you brought up Lane Hudson's name and, and, and I saw you smile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Michel Bergeron told me that it's a player that makes him smile too. Uh, kind of like your stature, but playing defense and yeah. the way he dangles. How much does he excite you? 
a lot. I mean, how could you not be excited watching his two games against Detroit, right? Um, what he did at, at BU, you know, there's always concerns. Oh, he's a small guy, this and that. And then he gets the puck and the control. And, and you saw NHL guys, how they weren't sure how to attack him. He's so fast. He's so quick. He's great on his edges. Um, he played a great game defensively. I thought he did very well. Um, you know, you could tell the system, the structure, it's going to take some time to adapt to that. But, you know, the good stick, good angling, his control, the pace, he, it felt like he controlled the game. And uh, it's a very, very exciting player. He's very dynamic. And as you see, the great teams in the league have great defense. If the puck can get out of your zone in the attacking zone, you're going to spend more time uh, with the puck. And that's something that uh, I think we're all excited about. Paul, awesome stuff. Thank you for your time. Thank you for making the time for me here. On behalf of everyone who's watching, everyone's listening in Montreal, throughout the entire province, Habs fans around the world, thank you so much for killing Toronto in the playoffs. That goal was fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much, Tony. Thanks again. All right, there you have it, Paul Byron. Your son. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. He's a good man. He really is a good man. From one good man to another, let's bring him in right now. He's a man they call Le Tigre, Michel Bergeron. It's funny because... At the, the hockey game that took place earlier today for the Foundation Cup, there were a couple of coaches. Michel Bergeron was coaching with former NHLer Maxim Talbot. And on the other side, on the other bench, we had Chris Nyland with Daniel Sauvageau. Chris Nyland's team got the better of Michel Bergeron's team earlier today at the Bell Center. But Michel said to me, 40 years later, the referee still can't give me a break. <laughs> well, uh... Well, I got I got to give the credit to Chris. His team was ready, but I don't know who makes the the draft. When I saw the, their team with Paul Byron and uh, Pascal Dupuis, I'm telling you, Tony Pascal Pascal Dupuis can play again. Oh yeah. Uh, did, did you see the yeah. way the way he's skating, the way he handles the puck, the way he shoots the puck? It was easy for him. Oh my God! I know he's uh, working for Shawin again. Yeah, he owns the team. Yeah, and uh, now Alexandre uh, Daigle was on the other team. Alexandre was there also. Yeah. We were good on defense with yes. Quintal, uh, Dandeno, Brisbois, Brisbois, saving in the net. But we uh, like we were like the Canadian. We were missing talent up there, uh, up, up front. The opposition also had Bruno Gervais and Francis and Bouillon Bruno on defense, Gervais. too. So ah, they were know. a pretty stacked team. Hey, Tony, I know, no, no. That, but I told them, I told the, uh, the management, I want to make the draft next year. <laughs> we, so we, you'll we, be back next year, eh? Barry <laughs> Lorenzetti does such amazing stuff in the community. Um, the fact that you're here today to be a part of it, to support him as well, the Foundation Cup. Uh, raising money to go towards mental health and towards autism. What's your connection with Barry and uh, and, 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 uh, Louis, and Louis Morissette? And Louis Morissette, of course. Louis Mar Morissette and Vero, they were uh, the, they, they're doing fantastic for the for the for the health for the autism, the, the autism for the, the the kids who needs uh, help. Was it them that reached out to you? Yeah. Uh, it was them that reached out? Yeah. To you. Okay, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, I can't, I can't miss a day like this, you know, because, okay, we, it's funny because we go back in the, our years and, uh, but the, the, these uh, foundations are doing so well. Yeah. So we need them. Michelle, I'm going to tell you something I told you before. So now I'm sounding redundant, but I told you off camera and I'm going to tell you on camera. For me, you have that it factor. You have something that other people don't have. To think in the 80s, you were persona non grata in the city of Montreal. As yeah. a matter of fact, you were hated. You were hated, right? You were the coach of the dreaded Quebec Nordiques. Not only were you the coach, you were the one who would stand up on the bench. You were the one who would go crazy. You were the one who would have the press conference and say, tell me I'm not going crazy. Maybe I'm going to have a heart attack. Or say, Remember when you used to say that? When the goal got called off to Alain Côté and the, all that stuff and the way that game turned like that. And then you actually... Also, you, you you come to Montreal, you beat the Canadians on an overtime goal. I believe it was Peter Stashney, if memory yeah, serves me in well. 85. In, in 1985. And, and so you were hated. 40 years later, 
you're loved in this city. It's like you're one of it's it's you're loved more than a former Montreal Canadian <laughs> was almost, you know. Well, you, you feel that though. You feel I that? feel that uh, Tony the, What does it mean to you to have well, that love it, it, when you were so hated it, 40 years ago? It's funny because I was a great fan of uh, the, the Canadian at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know at, at my age I I remember I I've seen the Maurice Richard, Jean Bilivo, Henri Richard, Doug Harvey. Don Marshall, you know. So and, you wanted to coach the Canadians. Then, I wanted to coach the Canadian after my years in the Quebec, but you know, it's why funny. do you think it didn't happen? Do you think it didn't happen because you were associated with Quebec and the fan no, base? No, I remember I met uh, Serge Chabot, who was a manager at the time, and uh, it was between me and uh, Jacques Demers, a '93, and. Uh, they chose Jacques Demers because they told me the doctor said because I had a heart attack before. Yeah. Well, maybe it was not the, the proper thing to do to our Bergeron. You think it was an excuse? Maybe, but I don't know. I don't know. But Jacques, uh, I, I, I keep saying Sir Savard at the time made the right decision. They won the cup. Or, yeah. And uh, Jacques Demers was uh, before that. Jacques, I. I was hired in Quebec when Jacques got fired. Remember the first yeah. year yeah. in the National Hockey League, Quebec was uh, Jacques Demers was the coach. Yeah. And after the first year, he got fired. And I was uh, I was uh, coming there, and Jacques was always b beside me. Yeah. He didn't coach, but uh, he. Uh, you went on to coach the New York Rangers after Quebec, of course. You took over Madison Square Garden and the Big Apple. Yeah. They embraced you, but unfortunately... You know what? You know what? When, when they, they came to me and said, Bergie, you're... Uh, because at the time, uh, Billy Martin was coaching the, yeah. the Yankees, and he says, the assistant of the Phyllis Pusito at the time says, hey, Bergie, you're a real New Yorker. You should come in New York. I said, well, and I was coaching Quebec for seven years, and maybe it was time for me to move on. You know, after seven years, you coach the same team, the same players. I had the Stashdies, Hunter, Goulet, Pema. Maybe it was time for me to move to, to move to New York. You know what? Growing up cheering for the Canadians, I hated Michel Bergeron once upon a time too, but I'll tell you the moment I fell in love with you. When you gave a chance to my childhood idol, Guy Lafleur. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget that. You had the camp, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was in Trois Trois the Vier. camp for the Rangers. When you brought in Guy Lafleur and you gave Guy Lafleur a chance after being forced into retirement, yeah, way too early before he wanted to, playing a style of hockey under Jacques Lemaire that he did not want to play. When you gave him that chance for me. I never forget that. When the. Uh, Guy called me in New York. He says, uh, his agent uh, told me Guy wants to come back. And I, I heard that Guy was playing in the Lake de Garage and he was in great shape. He was flying on the ice. And I told Phyllis Pistot at the time, I said, hey, I just got a call. La Fleur, Flower wants to come back. He says, hey, call him. Tell him to come in New York. And I remember I picked him up at the airport. And uh, Guy was, you know, Guy, uh, Flower, was in great shape. Wow, amazing. He says, well, and he came to New, uh, to the training camp in Tuarvia. He didn't have a contract. When you're talking about pressure, he didn't have a contract. And he, uh, he came to the camp in Tuarvia. He scored the first goal against John Van Biesbrook. Wow. I, I, I think John opened his leg. <laughs> Let the go, and uh, he signed the contract, and uh, that that's where I I remember the most about Guy. He was a great player. Everybody knows that, but I knew the man. He wasn't. The he wasn't the best player. No, but for me, he was the best. Does yeah. that make sense? All to you? around, he was the best. But he wasn't. Yeah, and I know in my heart he wasn't. Yeah. Or I know in my head that he wasn't, but in my heart he was. Yeah. You know, oh, Guy Lafleur didn't have the career that and Wayne Gretzky I, I'm had. Or I'm going to tell you a story about Guy. 
I told him when he signed the contract with the Ranger, I said, maybe, well, you're 37 now. You Maybe you, you won't play every game. And I do that in Minnesota. I, I decide that game, he didn't play, doesn't play. So, like, every game, he was there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I went to the ring. I said, hey, Guy, tonight you're not playing. He says, Bergy, you can do that. I play my best game in Minnesota. <laughs> I said, Guy, yeah. I told him, I said, Guy, you play your best game everywhere said, because you were the best. And that night he didn't play, but he was, he was fantastic. And one night he called me in New York, he says, we should go out with our wife. For yeah. dinner, I said I can't. I can't go, uh, uh, Gee, because I gotta see watch the game between the Islanders and the, the Devils. He said, "Don't, don't look at this game. This boring game." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, amazing stories. Yeah. I never get enough of the stories of Gila Fleur. My oh, childhood. Gila, I know. Listen, yeah. before we let you go, Barry Larenzetti is gonna drop by here in about a minute. Two players that I I really want to. I know you're high on them, but I want to have the people watching and listening an idea of how high you are, you are on them. You're right, Slavkovsky. Well, I can't see. I I I see ten man. Ten man is going to be good in the, maybe next year, maybe because he's he's only playing. You know, he he does a, he doesn't have to learn. He knows. He knows the game. He knows where to go. You know, says, uh, what, I, what I like uh, about him, let him play and coach him after. Don't coach him before. Just let him play. He's going to learn everything. He's, he's so good. Then he looks Who does he at, remind you of? Well, I got a, a few names. Tell me. Uh, uh, Marian also. Marion is a Hall and, of Famer. And uh, the one, the most is Mar uh, Mark Macy. But wow. not tougher like Macy because not for wow. Macy was mean. He was cross checking the guy behind. But I don't think uh, Slav will be like, like this. But the way, the way he's skating, the way he handles the puck, the way he shoots, Mark Macy looks. He, he, he remember, he remember wow. him, Mark Macy without the toughness. You're talking about a top 10 player in the history of the uh, National he's Hockey League be on tough, everyone's list. He's going to be a tough a top player. He's going to be, I think, the best player, the best forward of the Canadian, the Montreal Canadian. That, that's my opinion. Look, uh, I'll leave you with this on Slavkovsky. Two players in the history of the Montreal Canadiens at age 20 had a season of 20 goals or more and 50 points or more. The first one was Guy Lafleur. The second one is Uri Slavkowski. Yeah. But Pretty Gila, good company, Gila, eh? Yeah. Guy Lafleur was playing on the fourth line at the time. He didn't play uh, regularly. No, the first three years, Scotty didn't play him. No. But, uh, no, no. Uh, Secondly, yeah. and then I'll let you go. Lane Hudson. The sample size is not big. It's two games in the National Hockey League, but... Uh, I love him. You love him. I love him. Let him play. Let him play. Don't tell me uh, he's going to make some turnover. He's going to lose the puck somewhere. Not that. Let him play. You know, because, you no, know, like Madison this year, you no, know, he's minus 24. But he's on the ice when they, uh, they, uh, they, they pull out the goalie. for uh, he's, he's minus 12 or 13 when the Canadian pull of out course, the goalie. Because they're trying to get a goal, so he's yeah, on the yeah, ice to try and get that that's goal. That's right. Let him just let him play. It's... For a guy who has as much experience yeah. behind the bench as you did, and you have a wealth of knowledge to offer, last question, Barry Lorenzetti will come in. If there's one piece of advice you can give Martin St. Louis, what would it be? One piece. One well, piece. Uh, be a little tougher. When they like uh, the, la the last game of the year, when Anderson didn't show up, don't. Uh, you get the feeling though the next year that the honeymoon will be over with I him think, and some I, of I the hope players. So. I hope so. I hope so, man. 
Gee, they like it this what year. What would you have done with Josh Anderson getting paid five point five million well, a year? Well, they should and... they should take it off for a couple of games, just to make an example to the young players. You know, you got to be like uh, Martin said a lot of time. I got to be fair. So be fair with the kids, but be fair with the veteran. If you don't want to play, you don't play. That's we, it. We are live at Da Vinci Restaurant. Well, live, I'm saying this is just past 2 o'clock in the afternoon here at Da Vinci Restaurant on Bishop Street. And I took you away from your fantastic lunch for Thank a few you, minutes. So go back Excuse my English. I am your not, English is... I, hey, I, I'm losing it. I'm hey, losing your English it. is... I was not good that uh, that much, but I'm losing it. Your English is better than my French, and I'm making no, a lot no, of money no, in you're... French, so I think no, you can no, make no, a lot no, of money no, in English. I, I, I watch you with uh, JC, and you're very good. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Thank you, Tony. He was a great coach, <laughs> and he's a great man. And everyone, I never met anyone who met Michel Bergeron that didn't say that he's a great man. Not there in the time. 80s, though. <laughs> Not in the 80s, but 40 years later, he is. Okay. Let's take a part of Michel. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Without further ado, let's bring him in. He is the man of the hour. He's why we are here today at Da Vinci Restaurant, and he's why we were at the Bell Center earlier this morning. Uh, he is none other than uh, Barry Lorenzetti. Barry, good afternoon. Hey, thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. I, I appreciate the invitation. I, ap I appreciate being here. I appreciate being at the Bell Center earlier this morning. Uh, when Susan gave me a call to see if uh, I could come down and cover the event, I was beyond ecstatic. Uh, much respect to you and uh, everything you've done and everything you continue to do. Uh, I definitely know who you are, but we'll talk about the Foundation Cup in a minute. I know you don't like talking about yourself, but you're going to have to because some people watching, listening probably don't know who Barry Lorenzetti is. Maybe they've been living under a rock for the last couple of years, but... Well, Keith, a little bit about yourself. And, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, thanks so much, and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Really appreciate the invitation, and thank you so much for your support today. Um, I guess I guess my, I don't know if it's my real life or, or whatever, but uh, I'm a businessman in Montreal, um, uh, chairman and founder of uh, BFL Canada, which is the largest independently held uh, financial service team in Canada, uh, founded in 87. Um, and a company that's done extremely well uh, because of its employees and the commitment that we have from our staff and the resources that we have. We uh, have offices across Canada uh, and through uh, a, a joint venture with a, a rather large privately held uh, firm. We are represented in over 125, 130 countries worldwide. Um, what else can I tell you on the business side? Um, you, you could tell me that you love music and you're a great I, musician because I got I'm a call. I'm not a great musician, but hey, I... I got a call <laughs> while the game was going on this morning. Okay. Okay. At the Bell Center, I got a call from a, a very good personal friend of mine. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm at the Foundation Cup that Barry Lorenzetti is hosting here. And he said, ah... Oh, he loves to sing and he loves to play and he's an amazing musician. Well, you're you're being very kind. That call came from my buddy Mario Charpentier. Oh my Mario, yeah. one of the best, uh, most respected lawyers lawyers around. And you know, Mario is a great musician himself, a great pianist. And I had the pleasure uh, at one of our galas because our family has a foundation, as you know, which supports mental health. And uh, we've had this foundation running for eight years. And about six years ago, we decided that we would have an annual gala. And we brought folks like Mario, wannabe professional musicians, but, you know, decided to go a different venture. And uh, some doctors, some lawyers, and we decided that we would put together sort of like a cabaret to raise funds for our foundation. And I'm pleased to say that it's grown extremely well. I like to get up, do some Stones, some Beatles, some Elton John, and do stuff like this. It's fun. We have a ball. Uh, our musical director, Denny, is is very uh, astute. He's very uh, demanding, so you have to be pretty good before you get on stage. And last year, you know, we raised we raised over five hundred thousand dollars, and we wow. raised at least that uh, uh, for our foundation. We have it at Maison Principale sold out and it's actually sold out now it's already. proceeds going towards mental health mental correct? health absolutely mental health uh, veterans and you know which is a cause near and dear to my heart as well once upon a time i was uh, president of mindstrong the committee to raise uh, 
money for mental health for the Jewish General Hospital's mm -hmm. Department of mm -hmm. Psychiatry. I believe raised about $7 million in four years while I was there. Uh, because of the amazing team behind me, we should get you on our staff. Nothing, to do, you with, nothing, on our board. nothing to do with myself. It's an amazing committee yep. that was behind me. The Foundation Cup, how did this all come about? Oh boy, how did this come about? You know, I guess uh, BFL Canada, my firm supported Louis and Vero uh, with their foundation last year and raised some, some, some good funds for them. And uh, I, I had the thought that wouldn't it be interesting if if we could rent ice at the Bell Center and maybe change change the, um, the the mission a little bit to have our foundation uh, host an event such as this every year and have a trophy like the Foundation Cup where we would go to our uh, our folks our our sponsors our donators uh, choose a choose a a foundation of choice to support every year as well. But then just simply look, raise the capital and split it down the middle and not only raise some capital for our foundation, but help another foundation with, a, with a serious cause, which is autism and what Louis trying to do with building homes. And I think, I think it's just a magnificent. So when we had the concept and the idea, and since Louis was involved last year, it was an easy thing for me to reach out to Louis and say, you know, why don't we do this? And you know, we've become pretty good pals on the Happy. way. Happy and, and, and both, both, you know, I think what's important as well, you know, bringing, bringing the Anglophone, the Francophone community together for a change, which I think is great. Showing that, you know, we can work together. Yeah. If we put all of the other stuff aside and kind of work together and imagine if we can do this more often as equal partners in Quebec, how much more prosperous, how much more we could do as a province and more particularly as a city, especially Montreal, which needs it. <laughs> uh, no wiser words have been spoken, I think, in the last couple of years in this province. He's Barry Lorenzetti. $150,000 were raised today. Yep. Um, net. 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 Going towards mental health and going mm -hmm. towards Louis Barisette and Vero's foundation, yep. uh, which is their cause behind it is, is autism, of course. Uh, amazing. So this is this is something that uh, I would imagine is something that you'd like to see continue the Foundation Cup or yeah. I mean, are you already I, looking towards next year? Is there something all, else you're thinking about? You know, entrepreneurs look ahead all the time, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. We we're looking towards next year. Um, always looking to improve it. Um, it was interesting today when I was talking to some of our donors today. The Joe Broccolini, Broccolini family, the National Bank, of course, is here. Max Menard, who runs uh, Fiera Capital. You know, it's great when you do something like this and folks, when you're having lunch afterwards around the table, come up to you and say, hey, we want to do this again. We want to support you again. And, you know, I know so and so or so and so would love to be part of this. So maybe this can grow and maybe next year we raise more funds. But, you know, to see see the pros out there and how how generous they are and how of their time. And how well serving, you know, I, I was. I'd like to just give out a couple of names, by the way. Yep. Uh, Pascal Dupuis oh. played in today's game. Francis Bouillon played in today's game. Bruno Gervais played in today's game. Alexandre Degg played in today's game. Razor. Matthew Dandeneau, Stéphane Quintal, Patrice Brisbois, Pierre Marc Bouchard. I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of former NHLers that played in today's game. There was a lot of talent out there. And I, I owe a lot to Max Talbot. You know, Max Max brought all of these folks to the table, and he said, you know, they didn't hesitate when it's a good cause. And listen, to have Chris Nylon <laughs> behind, behind the bench and, and Michel Bergeron on the other side, that, that was quite entertaining as well. And look, I, I think it was a great day. Everybody had a great time. I just wish that uh, Jonathan Goldblum could have put the puck in the net. Uh, <laughs> we gave him about six opportunities. The pros passed the puck to him, and he and he missed six times. So, uh, you know, we'll have a we'll have a little chat later. <laughs> Barry Lawrence, Eddie, thank you for everything thank you, you do. So thank much you so much for having you me. Eh? Okay, appreciate Go back it. to your fantastic lunch at the Thanks fantastic so so Da Vinci Restaurant on Bishop you, Street sir. in downtown Montreal. There you have it. All right, okay. Max Talbot will join us in a couple of minutes. But uh, first, why don't we bring in a young lady? She's the ambassador for the foundation. Brittany Cannell Hello. is the ambassador for the foundation. How yes. are you? I'm great. How are you? Very good. Barry just uh, told everyone a little bit about himself and the foundation cup and and uh, and and everything. What what can you your connection to the event? Yeah. Um. So I'm a, a country singer here in Montreal. 
um, and I sing for the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, yes. Anthems. As a matter of fact, you, had a, we, you sang O Canada earlier today. And I sang O Canada today. And yeah. I'm also the ambassador for Barry's Foundation. Um, so when they asked me to to come sing the anthem this morning, I said, of course, I'll be there. And awesome. Yeah, the old hit the old stomping ground. So it was good. All right. So how is it for a country singer singing the anthem? Once you know how to sing, you know how to sing? Or oh, how is it? You know what? It's tough because everybody knows those lyrics. And yeah. the pressure is on no matter what, whether it's yeah. the Canadian, the U.S. anthem. It's a it's a big job. And can you put a country twist to the anthem, or you think it would be uh, accepted if you do? So I've tried I've tried a little bit. We yeah. have a country night at the Bell Center, okay. and so I invited my guitar player, and we got to do a, a country anthem. Yeah. Um. And but at the same time, I try to keep it uh, still, you know, down the middle. Not I don't want to. I don't want to be viral for I understand <laughs> the wrong reasons. So. What what is what does it mean to you to be ambassador for such a great foundation, such a great cause, such a great event? It means a lot, and uh, I'm a big fan of Barry. He's somebody I really look up to. He's an inspiration, and I've been able to be a part of the foundation for the last. He's few a years. mentor to many. He's a mentor, yeah, absolutely. So I get to learn a lot from him, being around him. Um, it's a great family to be a part of. And so when they asked me to be ambassador, it was, uh, it was a no brainer. I said, absolutely. I hear you have a new CD. I do. <laughs> All right. Talk to me about it. Um, I put out a record, uh, my second sophomore record last, uh, Friday. Yeah. Uh, it's called pink collar and it's a, a, a woman empowerment, uh, anthem kind of album. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about it and it's been doing well. So for the past 22 years, I've been doing radio, television, now podcasting, and I love to sing, but yeah. according to everyone who listens to me, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> at age 51, can I learn how to sing? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a like pro singer, pro as far as um, people that think they can't sing and want to sing. I yeah. am all for uh, saying that they can. So you can't just, you, 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 you don't have to be born with it, basically. Even if you're a terrible no, singer, I you can learn how to sing. I think so, because I'll be honest, like I was... I wasn't really a born a singer. Like I, I, I really worked hard at practicing and, and learning how to use my yeah. vocal cords. And um, I was more of, of a writer growing up. I loved yeah. to write songs, but I knew that to get those songs heard, I had to sing. So I had to work hard on my singing. So I believe, I believe in you that you could do this. Well, you know what? <laughs> uh, you, uh, you could teach me a lot because I had a, I love the anthem and Aww, I love your work. Thank you very and, much. And uh, you know what? I'm going to get my hands on the CD Aww, and you. support you in any that. way I can. Thank All right. You. Thank you for stopping thank by. I appreciate it. Yeah, there you, you have it. Brittany Kennel was the ambassador of the Foundation Cup. And of course, she sang the anthem earlier today. Let's bring him in. Uh, he is a former Stanley Cup champion. Of course, everyone remembers Game 7. Pittsburgh versus Detroit. Two big goals by Max Talbot and a 2-1 win. Big fan, Tony. Uh, <laughs> big, I don't think so. Big fan. No, I don't think so. You're not a big fan of mine. I'm a big fan of yours. A heart and soul guy when you played. What's your connection to the event exactly? Barry Lorenzetti just stopped by and said he wants to thank you for all the help in gathering all the guys and all the NHLers. How were you able to pull this off? Just, you know, uh, throughout the career, you know, you make a lot of good friends. Like the players are, are all awesome. You know, we're all retired right now and and you want to associate yourself with good causes and, and solid people. And, and that's exactly what, what we've been doing here, you know, trying to help out a great foundations. And, and it's fun for the guys too to be here. So for me, as you know, I try to help the guys and give a couple calls. Hey, can you come up to this event? And, and uh, it's fun. It's fun to do. And everybody said yes right away. You weren't playing today. You, you mentioned that you have a couple of injuries that probably just don't make it possible. You were coaching. Um, how much do you miss the game? <laughs> a lot i was biting my nails there behind the bench you know it's it's not the same you obviously want to be on the ice just got knee surgery i'll be back i'll be back next year i'll try to reclaim the the cup because i lost as a coach but uh i i miss everything about being in the rink that's what we miss the most i think players is you know i was telling my son he's 10 years old now and i'm like i just wish for your future that you're able to uh find a job that feels like like a game and that's, you know, his, his dad did that, his mom, my, my wife was a figure skater. Amazing. So every day you, you go to the rink and you you just have fun with the boys and you're 20 guys at the same age about. Yeah. And you just grow together also and yeah. you have a common purpose. Yeah. Common I don't goal. go to the rink, but this microphone is my rink. So I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Yeah. This, is, this is my passion. This exactly. is my love. And I told my kids the same thing. Yeah. But, you know, Michel Bergeron was in about 20 minutes ago. All right. And. 
I asked him to tell me one or two Gila Fleur stories because he was my childhood idol growing yeah. up, right? I love Gila Fleur. And I mentioned to Michelle, I said, you know, I know that Mich Gila Fleur was not the best player of all time. And, you know, there's Gretzky and there's Lemieux and, and you know, Jagger and Messier and others. But even though my head knows that he wasn't, in my heart, he was. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense to you. A lot, yeah. Today, the player I've most loved in the last 20 years is Sidney Crosby. I love Sidney Crosby. I love everything about him. I remember interviewing him when he was like 15 years old or 16 years old playing in Ramuski. Yep. Uh, and, and um, you know, everything I heard about him, I just find that the way he carries himself on the ice and off the ice, it's, it's exemplary. For me, based on the hockey that I've watched in my life, which goes back to probably about 1979, 1980, for me, Sidney Crosby is number three all time. Yeah, behind Gretzky and Lemieux, and I know that this opens up a huge can of worms. But there's a big debate. Yeah, but I it, get it. You can debate it, but it, it, yeah. it comes from your heart. It so comes from my you, heart, you so can, there's no debate. Yeah, tell me a Crosby story. <laughs> uh, well, because you have many. Yeah. I have one, by the way. Before you think of yours, my greatest Crosby story: All Star Weekend in Montreal. Yeah, two thousand nine. All the players are gathered at Bonanotte. Yes. At one point, I go to the men's room. All right. And, uh, and I got to go. So there's three urinals set up. I'm on the left. Crosby's in the middle. And Ovechkin on the right. Come on. <laughs> Sid picked the middle or you got there late? Uh, Who was the first one there? Because uh, you know that when there's three stalls, you never go in the middle first, right? That's Sid went rule. first. <laughs> okay. I don't and wanna, he picked the middle. I don't want to sound on. stalker. Oh, he's this just is, this sounds really bad. Okay? <laughs> he went first. He went in the middle. I went second. Don't get me wrong. I had to go, but I could have waited. But because Sid was going, I said, this is my chance to get close to Sid. That's a little creepy. That's it. That's very creepy. I should have said that. My God, it's on a podcast. And then Ovechkin walked in and uh, he went right on the run. I said, God. oh, my God, this is my claim to fame, right? I'm on a line with yeah. Crosby and Ovechkin. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. That's these guys score? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that's a good story. <laughs> I'm sure you have better stories than that one. <laughs> no. Give me, give me, uh, well, give me a Crosby story yeah. that probably not too many people know of. Well, one of the first one came into my mind is I, I played with Sid. I met Sid when he was uh, 13 years old. Uh, we were both uh, the, the, our agent was Pat Brisson. So with CA, and I worked for Pat when I retired for two years. I worked for CA and. All the your your draft year, you, he brings all the guys and 17 years old, and he brings them to LA and he has a big camp there. And you know, we all play against each other, guys from around the world. And he brought Sid when he was 13 to that camp. So there's Sid that's 13, all the guys that will be drafted like 16, 17 years old. And there's pros that work out in LA that comes just to, to be around the guys and show experience and stuff. So Luke Robita is on the ice, Christian Lio's on the ice, and That's the first time I saw Sid, Sidney Crosby play, and I met him. And at one time, one shift, he just took the puck and went and attacked Chilios. And he shifted one left, right, and he went between his leg, and he just went on the backhand shelf. And, and you're like, that kid is 13 years old. And Chilios probably was in his prime back then. And he, wow. he, he was so pissed off. You know, Chilios oh, was wow. his rage. But that's wow. just how good he was at that age, right? And after that, we played it. Uh, against each other at 16 and uh in the queue and in you know when we won the lottery in pittsburgh i was already drafted uh yeah, in pittsburgh and it was just okay we we get this kid we knew he was going to be special but at, at, i remember when he got in in you know his first year we had an old team in pittsburgh so there was recky leclerc mario was still playing zygmunt poffy whatever we have an old team and sid would already debate with Recky on the bench sometimes just about vision about you know no you shouldn't do that and and you know he's 18 years old and he'd go wow. and talk it and and Rex you know it was all in in love and everything yeah. but he was so imagine assertive. the confidence you have to have the yes. assertiveness here yes. he's a real one like, yes. vrai. like he was he was born man did his parents do an amazing job with him yes oh uh, amazing and, and you look at him now just the way because we hear about the story how great he is and everything but that's a quarter of all the stories that all the good he does around Pittsburgh yeah. that nobody talks about because he doesn't want it to be public. Yeah. Nothing he does is for the cameras or he doesn't have social media. He, he always, you know, thought about what's, what's good. And, and I was in Pittsburgh about uh, two months ago 
And uh, so we chat after the game and everything. Please let me know the next time you're going to go there. I'm going to give you my Crosby jersey to have signed. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have that signed. But he's like, hey, Max, uh, remember Jim? Uh, J- Jim's father died. I'm like, Jim, Jim. He's like, well, the, it was the guy that took care of the wife's room. And his father passed, unfortunately. But he's like, you know, and he's like, uh, after that, I went to talk to Jim. He's like, Max, he's like, you won't believe when... When my father passed, who do I see show up at the funeral home? It's his wife because the penguins were on the road, but it's his wife went to, wow. you know, because it's it's that it's community, it's it's the tightness and, and he's, all about, he's all about respect. He thinks about all these things. And, Amazing. and you walk around console energy center now, it's PPG paint. Yeah. And yeah. all the people, the, the security people, the place, the tickets and everything, it's yeah. all the same one that used to work at the melon, right? It's it, it Amazing. created something so uh, family organization, and and that that's Mario first of all. Yeah. But Mario transcended to Sid. Yeah, Mario yeah. up on uh, Jocks Second House in Villamard. I'm a LaSalle boy, and yeah, we used to go by the house all the time to see if Mario uh, Lemieux was there. You know, the offseason and special human being too. Uh, Mario Lemieux was I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, what are you in ending? What are you doing to to keep busy? I know you got different ventures, but from a hockey perspective, do you like do you like doing uh, analysis stuff yeah, like that or yeah, whatever? Yeah, yeah, it's it's you know. If very, I'm looking very, for a partner, start up a podcast en français. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you still bit. watch? You watch a lot? I do watch. I mean, I, I only had you know 20, 20 days of TV this year. You know, so it's not full okay. time. It's part time, but I, I obviously love watching hockey, and you know, my my two oldest kids are in hockey and. And I think, you know, we have to help her sport in some way in, in Quebec and everything and, and make it grow. And You coach? It's, I coach my kid, yeah. yeah. Uh, you try. find that hard to coach your kid? Yeah. Yeah, well, I coach the other kids because my I, kid I, doesn't want to. When them. you coach your kids, <laughs> yeah, there's either two ways it's going to go down. Yeah. Either you're going to be very hard on them or you'll probably favor them or, well, I'll, there's three ways it could go down, or you could really be fantastic and be really neutral. I coached my kids soccer when they were younger. I realized I got to stop doing this because I tried to show that there was no favoritism and I was hard and I was hard on five and six year old, my, my, my five year old, yeah. six year old sons. And I said, no, I can't do this. And yeah. I said, after one or two years, it's over. Let somebody else coach them yeah. because I found that was. Well, to me, it's. I coach for the other kids almost. And my son, as you know, if he wants to listen to me, he listens to me. But I, I, I feel like we have such a responsibility as explorer too to, to be there because it's it's, for you. it's the next you know generation. So yeah, so I love doing it. But yeah, the, the emotion gets in sometimes, but I learn with my kids that yeah, I coach the other kids. And if you want to hear my advice, you'll you'll get them, but there's definitely not uh, intensity or uh, I'm I'm very uh, you know calm with all this. Yeah. Okay, before I let you go, yes, predictions. Yes. Carolina versus the Islanders. Uh, Carolina and seven. So I was on with the uh, Larak and Gonzalez on BPM Sports earlier today, and they asked me for my predictions, and I said, because I don't have the only because I don't have the courage to say the Islanders because nobody will. I will say Carolina seven games overtime, but I said that's how much I believe yeah. the Islanders will push Carolina. Oh. I just. They've been playing playoff games for a month and a yes. half. The Islanders have, yes, and those teams are dangerous, right? And and I had Patrick Waugh coaching me in Colorado, and he, he had Varlamov in that. And I feel like it's kind of the, he had a Vizina career season. He, he didn't yeah. win the trophy, but he yeah. was nominated. So I feel that there's that kind of he was so good that year. So if he's as good as he was and as good as he's been, the goalie will could make a difference. Boston, Toronto, Boston, Boston in six. I got Toronto. The only thing I don't like, I, I had Toronto all along. I didn't like Sheldon Keefe saying that Matthews' 69 goals to hit 70 was a distraction. I, I Maybe it was, but I don't think he should have said that. I, I just, they failed so many years that I feel that it's, there's a mental aspect of it. Yeah, last year they did a little bit better, but I feel that failing after and after over, and it's tough for me, and, and Boston... Last year they fell miserably after yeah. you know having the best season ever. Uh, so I think Boston will. Uh, Carolyn will will let this here standing by. We're gonna get to her, so we'll speed. We'll go yeah. through this pretty fast. Florida, Tampa. 
Florida, but in six, it's going to be tough. Rangers, Washington. Rangers. Winnipeg, Colorado. Colorado. Vancouver, Nashville. Vancouver. Dallas, Vegas. Vegas. Edmonton, LA. Edmonton. Uh, you know, I think we have a lot of the a lot of the same picks, except for uh, I, I got Toronto over Boston. I look, I, I know they failed a lot, but they did beat Tampa Bay last two year. Bucks. We'll two bucks. Two uh, bucks. No problem. Two bucks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, two bucks. <laughs> Thank you so much, hey no Max problem. Talbot. I Thank appreciate you. it. Eh? Me too. And uh, we'll do an e-transfer. There you have it. We got two bucks. He's got uh, Boston. I got Toronto. How are you? Bonjour, Tony. We bring her in, uh, the great Carolyn Willett. Bonjour, Tony. Hall of Famer. Thank you. How does That's that feel? Like when you hear that, it's so surreal. Really? So surreal. Eh? I might need a few more years to uh, realize that. Talk to me about the Hall of Fame, like the whole experience you found out, you got the call. Was mm -hmm. it Lanny McDonald or? Yes, but uh, strangely well, enough, it was the same day as I was receiving the Order of Quebec. Wow. So I was never able to answer my phone. Oh, my even God. Even though I had missed like five calls from the Hall of Fame. So I tried calling back, but it was an automatic an automate message from the Hall of Fame. So yeah. I never spoke to him. Then the ceremony started. So I actually found out uh, online on TSM. Oh, my so, God. Isn't that um, something? But I... it was really special because then everyone else that was there, yeah. all the, my family, the nominees, the premier of Quebec found out at the same time. So it's a day I'll never forget. And then just the, the ceremony at the Hall of Fame was really, really special just to be able to be inducted with uh, someone like yeah. Pierre Surgeon and some of my childhood heroes. It was something I'll never forget. I saw you last probably, I don't know, uh, give or take nine months ago, maybe uh, at another event at another gala and you were being honored uh, by Barry. Okay. And so your connection to Barry Lorenzetti, because I know that he is the president of the Carolyn Willett fan club, by the way. <laughs> so talk to me about the mutual admiration yeah. and, and the respect that you have for Barry Lorenzetti and what's your connection and yes. your connection to Barry and your connection to the Foundation Cup. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we met several years ago when I was the, ch the chair of the Player uh, Association for Hockey Canada. And he just invited me uh, to go grab lunch. And I met their uh, man that's absolutely wonderful, that's so passionate for the growth of hockey for both girls and boys. And I feel throughout the years... He's really, been, really passionate about yes, the women's game. Really absolutely. passionate about and, the women's uh, game. Like just creating the BFL Coach of the Year. It's such a special program that gets to recognize of incredible women across the country and then his help for the national women's team uh, camps that were able to all because of his support so he became a really great friend he helped me with the nonprofit that i started in 2014 to help grow and develop girls hockey here in quebec and we went from around 50 teams to 114 last year and the last two years our finals have been at the bell center i wouldn't be able to do that without barry and, and the bfl Canada. So it's uh, for me to be here today. It's an absolute pleasure. I had a ton of fun and it's incredible to see how much he gives back uh, to the community he grew up in and how much he wants to empower women along the way. I have to tell you, and I'm not going to lie to you, I'm very pleasantly surprised by the success of the PWHL in terms of ratings, in terms of numbers, in terms of attendance. Were you at all worried when the leak kicked off that it wasn't going to be as accepted as it has and it wasn't going to have the same success that it's, that it's experiencing right now? I think just like you said, I didn't expect that it would be this incredible because I've been part of several leagues where, you know, it was hard to get it off the ground. And to be honest, when I saw it launch and then I just saw the media attention around it, I started to believe that it would there be... There were indicators yes, there that it was going to go absolutely. well. Absolutely. And for example, for Julie and I, right from the side, we're like, we got to buy season tickets because we got to support the dream that we never had in wow. our careers. And you know what I realized? So many players that I played with or against did that. So I go to games and not only do I see players that I played with or against that have season tickets, but also fans that cheered us on with Montreal Canadiens back then and are still 
Like we're waiting for this moment forever. So last night I was at the Verdun Auditorium and I saw the team come back from four behind. three win. It was incredible. What a game! Late in the game, yeah. score going the power play, Absolutely. tying it up. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I so saw I that. think it's just gonna grow and continue to develop from here. I think the caliber is gonna get better and better because yeah. for the first time these women can focus on solely being hockey athletes. But as much as have. you're so happy and so proud, is there? A part of you that is like, even though you had some great experiences, and uh, it, was it a gold four times? Or I'm yes. going off the top of my head yeah. here. Okay, You're four good. Olympic golds. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm sure you would have wanted to be a part of this right now. What's going on with the PWHL? Oh. You had an amazing career. Yeah. You had so many great moments. <laughs> but is there a part of you that says, "Man, the timing"? Yeah. For sure, like I'm super envious of what they have and yeah. I look at it and I'm super, super proud to witness all that success. But to be honest, I know that the women before me I hit so hard and I still love what I got to have in my career, my college experience and then the, my experience with the CWHL, with Montreal Canadiens, and where I won four Clarkson Cup with Marie-Philippe Poulain. And so many different, like Shannon Labonte, Kim St. Pierre. She just scored a couple of goals at the World oh, Championships yeah. that she not on right there. She was pretty amazing. And it, she's so Spooner's really it, good. Oh yeah, Spooner, Spooner just had a baby, just came back, is leaning. The she's a big time and, goal scorer. Yeah, I think she's absolutely. got 15 goals if yeah. memory serves me well. So tied with points with Marie Philippe Poulain, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So but it's for incredible. me. Marie Philippe Poulain is still the best player in the oh, women's absolutely. player in the world, eh? Because of how she show up in important games, right? So Clutch. being exact exactly and and what people don't realize is how hard she works every day. Like she's first in line. She goes all out to the point where she falls at times because she pushes her edge work all the time. Or every time she shoots, it's the best shot that she can take. So she's a huge inspiration to other, but she has been able to improve her game every year. And to see her have that success in the final was uh, absolutely incredible and deserving because she's earned that. She came back from a really tough injury and we built her up back up to be better and better and better. And I wasn't worried. I knew that she was ready for that final game and she showed Amazing. why she's the best. And if you want to see why she is the best tomorrow yeah. at the Bell Center, Montreal versus Toronto, PWHL, and what they're saying is going to be the highest attendance for a women's hockey game ever. Ever. Yeah. You got goosebumps? I do, absolutely. And I can't wait to witness it. It's so what we're going to see tomorrow, and the game is going to be televised and it's going to be on radio and everything, yeah. is that – for you, is that art going to be the standard going forward? Is Are you expecting now, after everything we know and where it's headed, are you expecting this kind of attendance, this kind of ratings, this kind of publicity going forward? Do you but think they can maintain again, that? Again, I never thought that in around 20 minutes we would set up the Bell Center with the Montreal team. So it's, it's exceeded amazing. all my expectations. And, you know, just being part of that game yesterday, it was so exciting. You watch the, the final of the world championship that just happened. So fun, so yeah. exciting. It's back and forth, great hockey, physical, fast. Women don't take a shift off. They yeah. give their best every shift. So I think it's just going to continue I love the game, grow. but I have to tell I really love it at the Olympics. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, at the Olympics, there's just yeah. so much on the line, and, yeah. and you feel it's a, it's it's really something. So. Karen Willette, thank you so much for everything you've done for the game. Congratulations on an amazing career. I've told you that already several times. Uh, if you wanted to script a career, uh, can't get better than Carolyn Willette. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, so j'apprécie. Yeah. There you have it. Go back to your to your lunch. Yeah, thank Took you. you away from lunch. Bye. Hopefully, there's still some left, all right? I'm sure. All Bye. right, there you have it. Okay. Carolyn will add. Uh, Marinero, it's a sick podcast. I talked to you about Energy Transportation Group, uh, our proud partner and sponsor, as well as Labitta TV, another proud partner and sponsor. I also want to talk to you about Playground. You don't want to miss Night Fever live at Playground Thursday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Dance the night away and experience the magic of the Bee Gees music in a show that celebrates their timeless legacy. The show will take place under the Grand Marquis, a beautiful temporary structure that is perfect for electrifying events like this one, Playground, your entertainment destination. Visit playground.ca for details. I just want to let you know that former Montreal Canadian Sergio Momesso is coming on. Sergio Momesso will join us in about a minute. Uh, before he gets to us, join our NHL playoff bracket. 
The link is in the description. This is what it looks like, and you can find it everywhere on social media. Um, and uh, once again, you can find it on Twitter and Instagram as well. All right, so there you have it, our NHL playoff bracket. We gave our NHL predictions earlier on, and so if you join our bracket, of course, best of luck to you. Okay, uh, we are waiting for uh, Sergio Momesso, who should be joining us in about a minute. Shane Gomo, if you can go get Sergio, please, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Sergio is coming. All right, okay. All right, here he is. He's coming, I've been told. Is he here? He is not here. All right, okay. Okay, they're looking for him. All right, okay, not a problem, not a problem. Uh, in case you missed it, and you're joining us just now, um, Paul Byron joined us from the start of the podcast. Uh, Michel Bergeron joined us. Barry Lorenzetti. Max Talbot, uh, Brittany Kennel, who uh, sang the anthem earlier today at the Foundation Cup event and sings the anthem at the uh, Bell Center, uh, has a new CD coming out, and she's a country singer. And, of course, moments ago, it was Carolyn Ouellette. Uh, once again, if you are joining us right now, the Foundation Cup is an event uh, that was put together by Barry Lorenzetti and um, raising money for... Uh, mental health and for autism with the Louis uh, Morissette and Vero Foundation as well. And uh, we are, this is, this took place earlier this morning. The hockey game started around 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, right now it's, uh, it's in the afternoon. It is not even 2.30 uh, PM that we're doing this live from, Da Vinci Restaurant on Bishop Street in downtown Montreal, where they're serving all of us a great lunch. Many former NHLers took part in the event today. Uh, Pascal Dupuis, Alexandre Daigle, Bruno Gervais, uh, Francis Bouillon, Mathieu Dandeneau, Pratis Brisbois, Stéphane Quintel, uh, Pierre-Marc Bouchard, uh, and Sergio Momesso. There he is. How's it going, Tony? Uh, very well. Uh, Sergio and I work together for the same radio station for a very, very long time. So uh, there's a lot of respect there, at least that I have for Sergio. I can tell you that. He also had a chance to work many games for T or several games for TSN television in the past year. Hopefully many more going forward. Sergio, uh, awesome event today. And uh, I, I have to tell you that you were on the winning side and the team that was on the losing side uh, they thought that there wasn't always some fair play, that you guys were double shifting some of your best players mm. and you had the pedal to the metal the entire time. You want to comment on that? Or? Well, that was uh, definitely, we had three centers. So we had, listen to this, we had Paul Byron, Pascal Dupuis, and uh, Alexandre Dijk. Yeah. And we had four lines. So our centers were going every three times. I was a left winger, so I had nothing to do with this. And those guys were on the ice all the time, like every three shifts. And so we're definitely stronger at that position. So, um, you know, they were flying. I mean, listen, they're 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 not that old. We're we're almost in our sixties, and these guys are in their mid mid to early forties. So it makes a difference. So, yeah, we did have the stronger team. There's no question. But I think in the end, everyone's downstairs now here at the restaurant. They're having a good time. Yeah, they're, they're eating well. They're having some nice wine, so uh, good stuff. everyone's good. Everyone's good. Sergio, yeah. everyone loves listening to you talk about the Montreal Canadiens because, of course, yeah. you've been doing it for many, many years as a former voice uh, or uh, a color man on Montreal Canadiens broadcast on radio. And once again, you had a chance to do several games this year on television. You know, he's not the first person that people want to talk to you about when they talk about Canadians, but I was watching you earlier today at the Bell Center, and Sergio Momesso was a big, strong winger who had a lot of physical and athletic attributes when he played. And today, I think of Josh Anderson, who's big and he's strong, but he hasn't been able to put it together. Here's a guy with a 27-goal season with Columbus, give or take about four years ago, I believe. And with the Canadians, you see flashes, but more often than not, you see a ton of inconsistency. As a guy who was a big, strong player, a winger as well, do you see some of the challenges he has or where you think he's going wrong? And do you have some advice that you think you can give that could probably help a guy like that? You know, it, it's strange. You know, I, w I was watching him and I, I, I love what Josh Anderson because that's, you know, a power forward, like, like you mentioned. And, and when you saw him when uh, they were in the playoffs, I know it was during COVID time, but he is tenacious. He can go up and down and, and really make uh, life hard for opposing defensemen. 
I think he got away from his style of game where pretty much is, you know, up and down, simple, north south, physical, and 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 just play that way. And I think when Josh gets out of sorts is when he tries to do too much. And I'll never forget. I mean, I mean, I played in different positions, different, um, let's say, first line or third line. I went to St. Louis, and I was, you know, when you play in a third line, it's pretty simple. You know, you you go up and down, north south. You get the puck in deep, and you forecheck, and and then that's the way you play. Then I got, I ended up playing with Brett Hall and, and Adam Oates, and and the, for the first couple of games, you you start to play their style of game. Let's say you're playing with Suzuki and Caulfield. So they like to dangle. They like to cross the blue line. They like to make passes. And it's not always north-south. It's it's hold the puck, get in the zone, wait for the late guy, and stuff like that. And I think, you know, like I got lost sometimes playing that type of game. And I, and, and I found it hard because they don't play the same type of style. And you have to adapt. But at the end of the day, you can't change your game. You're on that line uh, to give them some space and some room. You can't change. As soon as they cross the line, you still got to drive the net. You got to be the guy in the corner. You got to be the guy in front of the net and let them do all that type Ar of work. Armia was really good in the last three months, eh? Absolutely. He was really good. And and uh, so you, you saw them with New Hook and, and I believe it was Gallagher. I'm not exactly yeah, and, sure. And the hope is, yeah. is that Anderson will have an Armia bounce back kind of year next year. Right. That's Obviously, the with the contract that he has, it's not an easy contract to move. Um, I think he's a very good guy and well respected. He's a guy to me that you have to give him the puck when he crosses the blue line at that point. If he doesn't get it at that time, if he's handling the puck too much, it's not a good thing. But Sergio, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. He's also the type of guy that if you get him that puck in that situation, he has to put that head down put and that drive it out and drive that. He out. has to drive it out. If he doesn't score, it doesn't matter. Maybe somebody else will score after that, creating the space and the room going to the front of the net. So I think he got into a space at the end where he was just trying to do too much. Yeah. And he, it's not his style. It's Sergio, his style. it's always a treat. I won't take up too much of your time. No, but that's I, no I, problem. No I problem. Do, I mean, for First me, of all, I'd like to say, Congrats on your podcast. Thank you. And Sandra. also uh, working on TBR. Good stuff. Thank you. I appreciate that, yeah, Sandra. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, the greatest story in the Canadians this year, I'll keep you for two more questions, okay? Tough the Seth first Klaus, one Seth is, Klosky, yeah. for me, the greatest story is Slavkovsky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask you about him okay. because it's the greatest story, but I want to ask you for the greatest story of the Montreal Canadiens this year, not named Uri Slavkovsky, is who in your opinion? Hmm. Or is what? And it could be a coach. Hmm. Could be a special teams, could be a player. Well, obviously, I like the the story of Mike Matheson. I think he's evolved to be that uh, number one defenseman carrying the puck up the play. I think he's had a great season. Um, if I could cut you off for one second, sure. it's funny because I had Michel Bergeron about forty five minutes ago. You know what he yeah. said? Because I'm sick and tired of everyone talking about Matheson being a minus twenty five or twenty six. He goes, he's on the ice when they trail by a goal and they pull the goalie. So he ends up being a minus 12 in that situation if the other team scores an empty that goal against them. And he says, this plus minus stats are not all that bad. You know, and if, when you think about it, I think Matheson's a great story. He's over 60 points. Absolutely. And he, he definitely adds to the offense that they want. And, and we saw this year the Canadians were, I'm not, not exactly sure, were they second or third overall in the league for defenseman scoring? So I think they're good in that department where their defense have added to their offense. And we, as we know, here we're, we're at the point where, and I think obviously Kent Hughes and, and Jeff Gordon know, this is like, we got to take the next step now. People have, have watched this team for the last three years. Okay, now we want to make the playoffs. Can we get there next year? Everyone's kind of been patient in Montreal. I've talked to friends that are uh, season ticket holders and stuff. Okay, the defense are there. Now we need some offense. This is where we need to see... They got all their draft picks. They got all their their money in order, and and Kent Hughes admitted it after the year. This is this is where we got to make the next step, and I and I hope that they do, and I think they will. They're smart enough. They understand. We need some forwards now that we can score some goals and get secondary scoring. If Kirby Doc can be, um, you know, healthy, that would definitely help a lot because that first line can't do it all alone. As not. we know, the secondary scoring, we got some from New. Listen, let's face it, New Hook. Armia, and I believe Gallagher, that's a good third line. Yes. They need a second line You're scoring right. to help these guys 
get to that next level. You if think they Joshua Noah so. has the ability and potential to probably be that guy one day? I think so. I, I'm not saying next year, but I think he can. I, I like the way when he was in there. He has the He's smarts. Got He's, got He's got skill. Yeah. You could see that. And and I hope. And I hope. So we know Nick Suzuki and Caulfield, they're, 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 they're the number one guys. And Slavkovsky's on that line for a 20-year-old. He's fit in. Uh, but they need a second line scoring. There's no question. Uh, they need some depth at forward position. And if they get that, you know, they they can get those 10, 12 extra points where they can be in the playoffs. Last one for you. Does yeah. the word untouchable in hockey or in sports, does it exist for you? Or do you, do you think anyone's well, untouchable? Or? Wayne Gretzky was untouchable, but he got traded. Yeah, you're so right. What, so who are you talking about? I'm talking about, like, have you put that label on any Montreal Canadian player? Is there a player for you that's an untouchable? Like, uh, I would put Suzuki as an untouchable right now, and I would put Slavkowski as an untouchable. Would you put them as an untouchable? I think or? that whole line with Caulfield. I mean, they signed these. The whole line's untouchable. The for whole, you, yeah. the whole. I mean, this is their future. Yeah, this is their future. So they want to build around those guys. Um, so I think that line is untouchable. I do, and then they got to build around those guys to help them, not just have, feel all the pressure that they have to be. They have to score every night. There's nights where they they won't because they're matched up against the top lines against the other league, the top defensive pairings and stuff. So they need some help. There's no question. I think uh, that's where they, they need to focus on. I, I like I like Montembeau. I like Primo at the end of the year in general. Uh, I think, uh, you know, they had to go that way on, on as the goaltending. It worked out. So they need some depth on forward, and we all can agree on that. And I think that they got if, if Kirby Doc gets back healthy and he has some help on the wings where they can get some goals for that on that second line, you know, then, then that can get them to the playoffs next year. So hopefully that, that'll be the case because everything everybody in Montreal wants to see us keep going forward in that progression. I think people have been patient in Montreal for the yeah. most part. It's been well accepted, eh? For I think it's been pretty much accepted. For three years in a row, you would think that uh, yeah, I think some so. people would have gone nuts by now, but it's been pretty good. No, it's I been think pretty it's, good. They have a lot of confidence in the management team, the coaching staff, the people behind it. I think so. Yeah. I think so, too. And 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 I'm and for me, too, I want to see them in the playoffs. I want to see them get there. It's nice to watch the first round that's coming yeah. up on the weekend, but it's other teams. Oh, that I could do. Yeah, I, I said it was the last question. Okay. Who do you think is going to the Stanley Cup final? This will really be the last one. Wow. Well. <laughs> I think gonna, this is the I'm, toughest year in all of them. I'm going to start with the West. And it's funny because I, I'm hoping. I think I think Dallas is is, is going to be tough to, to handle out in the West. Yeah. I'll have to say Dallas in the West. I'm telling you in the East, it's a flip of a coin. I really don't know how Boston's going to do. You think your buddy Patrick Waugh could pull off the upset? No, I don't think he has the horses to go. Maybe. Um, he's going to push them, though. He's going to push them, but I, I don't think he has the scoring to, to go further. Um, I, I like, I mean, the Rangers are are, are fun to watch. I, li I like that team. Um, you know, I mean, Tampa could be like a wild card. They, the way they've played of late, yeah. the way they've played of late, I, I think the East is wide open. I, I really do. There's so many good teams in the Can't East. Can't take penalties versus Tampa. Their power play is really good. It'd be fun to watch. I'm really looking forward yeah. to watch the first round. There's no, there's no question about I it. I said so. I hope McDavid wins the cup. And you yeah. know, like, I, I'm, I'm for great players winning the Stanley Cup because if they don't. Then there's, you know, why he wasn't able to lead his team to a cup. I don't want to hear yeah, but that. Can't, but, you know, at the end of the day, him, like McDavid and Drysaddle, they, they just can't do everything. Yeah, you're right. They, they can they can, they can score. Not everyone sees it like that, they right? Can, if you want they, to they can get on the four, guy here, They yeah. can get four goals, but if they give up five, yeah. you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, their goaltending has to come up. Just like Colorado, I know that they've had some trouble on goaltending. Listen, I'm hoping for Vancouver. Uh, as an ex uh, Canuck, of course, I'm hoping for Winnipeg. Uh, I'd like to see a Canadian. It's, the, it's team. the best chance that Canada, that bringing the cup back to Canada, this is probably the best. Chance. I, re I, I really like Winnipeg. You know, like it'll be interesting to see the the Jets there on that one. So it's always fun to watch the playoffs. Sergio, thanks for coming by. You welcome. I love this guy, Sergio yeah. Momesso. We're together you for a long go. time. He's a good friend. He's a good man. All right, thanks so much. It's a sick podcast. He's Sergio Momesso. I'm Marinero. Special thanks to our partners. Energy Transportation Group, thank you very much. Labita TV, thank you very much. Playground, thank you very much. Thank you to Barry Lorenzetti for having us here, of course.
the Barry F. Lorenzetti Foundation. It was the Foundation Cup that took place earlier today, raised $150,000 towards Louis Morissette and Vero Autism, and, of course, towards mental health. What a great day. What an event. And I hope you all enjoyed watching it tonight. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Have a great weekend. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.